Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this talk through the rain. This is not a small fit. Um, well, uh, I would like to start thanking AJ and the rest of the organizers for inviting me here and for organizing this fantastic workshop so far. I'm sure we'll keep on, keep on enjoying it. Uh, I'm presenting this afternoon two pieces of research, as you can see from the organization here. This is joint work with quite a lot of people. Uh, well, most of them, most of these collaborators have been working at some point uh, on this part of the talk, on linear, non-linear important samplers, which uh, I will be talking about in five minutes. And then uh, my student, Dennis Akildi, is, is basically the main author for the second part. This is part of his thesis, and Dennis is right here. Okay, so let's start. I, essentially, the talk has two parts. Well, I will start with some brief introduction, but then we'll be talking like 20 minutes about only important samplers, another 20 minutes about something that we call nudge particle filters, not to be mistaken with most nudging uh, schemes out there. So um, the basic aim here, the basic goal that we had in, in these two pieces of research were to address uh, the main difficulty with important samplers when you, uh, when you tackle some, some sort of complex inference problem, which is weight degeneracy. So um, what we were trying to do was to improve the efficiency of important samplers in any of the versions, either adaptive important samplers or iterative schemes or particle filters and rec you know, recursive setups. And we were trying to attain this improvement uh, by, let's say, simple tricks. So by simple tricks, what I mean is trying to figure out some uh, 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 plug-in steps that you could uh, insert easily in your favorite algorithm and somehow make it work a bit better without uh, investing hugely on computational effort. Okay? And, and this, is based, this is essentially one of the common features between these two classes of algorithms, and that's why I'm explaining them together, actually. The other uh, common feature is that when we uh, perform these tricks, when we plug these extra steps, normally we do it, we do it using some heuristics because we want to tackle some, uh, some aspect of the degeneracy problem. And uh, the price to pay is that we introduce extra bias in, in the algorithm, in the Monte Carlo approximations. So then you have to look at it and you have to uh, assess whether that bias may be, may be destroying the convergence properties of the, of the algorithm or not. So just to start introducing uh, not my notation and uh, describing the, the problem kind of progressively, um, uh, for the, especially for the first part of the talk, the kind of problems I'm going to look at is the approximation of integrals of some test function f with respect to a probability measure p, capital P. So I want to approximate this kind of intervals here, right? Uh, I'm assuming, in general, that I've got some density for, uh, for the measure capital P, so this is the small p in this integral, and I can evaluate pointwise this density up to some uh, proportionality constant. Okay, so this is the usual setup for important sampling. Then, uh, normally, uh, this density or this distribution is too complicated or too costly to uh, generate samples from it directly, so we use some proposal, and I'm using here Q for, to denote my proposals, and uh, we compute importance weights. Uh, the importance weight being the ratio between uh, function H, which is proportional, proportional to the target density, and my proposal PDF. Okay? So this is, the basic, uh, this is the basic importance sampler. I draw N samples, N ID samples from my proposal Q, I compute weights, I normalize them, and there you go, you've got your approximation of the target measure P supper N. And then I can compute intervals, I can approximate intervals. Please remember this notation I'm using for intervals, okay? This is the interval of F with respect to measure P, capital P. Right. So this is uh, very standard, and there are also many standard result, results showing that under mild assumptions, we are able to make this algorithm uh, converge almost surely with rate, uh, the square root of the number of samples that you, ha you have generated. 
Okay, there are many ways to state this result. Um, and the big issue with this kind of uh, algorithms in any of their versions, and an issue that may show in different ways, is that the weights uh, often uh, become degenerate become, uh, when the uh, complexity of the problem increases in some way. So typically, and especially uh, has to be said in a workshop like this one, when you increase the dimension or where you are trying to perform inference, when you are increasing the dimension of your state space, normally what you will see with this kind of uh, naive important sampler is that the maximum weight will converge to one while all others vanish, which means that instead of getting a Monte Carlo approximation of your target measure, instead of getting a grid uh, representing, uh, random grid representing your distribution, what you get is a single point. That single point actually in practice may not even be particularly significant. Okay? So basically the algorithm fails in practice. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the dimension. If you, for example, if you simply have a target PDF that, such that in a fixed dimension by changing some parameter like a variance, it becomes uh, more uh, narrower and narrower. So the probability tends to concentrate more and more in a small region compared to the complete the state space, you actually have the same phenomenon. And I will show you with an example. Okay. So uh, this is a rather simple example. It's, uh, well, it's two-dimensional. So I'm generating uh, two-dimensional observations y from uh, this model, which is a mixture of two Gaussians. Uh, the variance for uh, the Gaussians, well, I'm assuming, yeah, I'm assuming the, this is, this stands for a covariance, uh, diagonal covariance matrix with a scale by sigma square. The parameter rho that determines the mixture is also known, so the only thing I want to estimate here are the means x1 and x2, okay? Um, so, uh, in terms of the notation in the previous slide, the target distribution is essentially the posterior distribution of the means of the locations of the Gaussians given uh, the data. The data are IID samples from this model, from model one, okay, for, 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 for this example. So H, this function disproportional to the target density, is actually the likelihood of the means, so the two parameters I want to estimate, times the prior, right? And the likelihood can be, can be computed using this equation here. So if I use the prior, uh, it's going to be normal, by the way, as a proposal, and I sample, I may obtain something like this. So this is my prior. So I sample the two locations independently with variance 10, and the, um, and this variance is 10 times bigger than the variance parameter in the mixture, okay? So in that case, what you would obtain would be typically something like this. My likelihood is concentrated in this small region here, and when you sample a few times, here are maybe, maybe 50, 60 samples, I, I can't really remember, what you obtain are all these samples in blue, which essentially collect no weight, because the tails of the likelihood fall very rapidly, and then everything is concentrated, everything goes to this red dot here, which is the closest sample, which, is, which after normalization is going to take uh, a weight which is nearly one, okay? You may have something left for this other sample which is right here, but not much. So you essentially get a representation in one or two points. And this is obviously bad. Another way of looking at it, is what happens for this model when you increase the number of data points that you use for inference. So ideally, you would like to get a, a random grid representation, the current representation where the weights are one over n, n being the number of samples that you generate. So as n increases, you would like to see the weights behave like this curve here in black. But what happens really is that, sorry, I'm making some strange noise here. Sorry. What happens really is that as you increase the number of uh, data points, 
the way it's uh, uh, degenerate. So this is what happens with a single data point. This is with 10 data points, 100 and 1,000. With 1,000 data points, the maximum weight is essentially one unless you generate something around maybe 700, 800 samples. Okay. So we haven't changed the dimension. We just have shrinked the likelihood. And this is the effect. You, you get good degeneracy. And this is another way of seeing the same phenomenon, but by looking at the affected sample size. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to tell you about two very simple methods uh, that are aimed at mitigating this degeneracy phenomenon. You are, we are not going to remove it. I'm not going to show you any proofs that uh, degeneracy does not occur. I will show you examples showing that you can actually numerically make things work a bit better. And I will show you analytical results showing that at least you are not uh, losing anything in terms of asymptotic uh, behavior. Okay. Uh, as I said, the two methods have in common that they are implemented very easily. You, you take your favorite uh, algorithm and you basically need to add one or two additional steps. So uh, hardly any additional cost. And the other uh, common feature is that uh, we are going to get improper weights. Or in other words, we are going to introduce additional bias in our approximations, and, and we have to uh, uh, somehow take that into account. So, first part, it's about nonlinear important samplers. Okay, what's a nonlinear important sampler? Okay, I think the best way to, to describe it is to show you what you do with the algorithm. So, this is the standard. Uh, important sampler, we draw from the proposal, compute weights, normalize, and build the approximation. Now, what do you do with this algorithm? I add, essentially, this step here. So now I generate from my proposal, the same as before. I compute the non-normalized weights, the same as before. And then, before normalizing them, I apply a non-linearity, which I'm I'm using this letter phi here to denote this nonlinearity, to the non-normalized weights, and I get transformed weights, transformed importance weights, using this uh, shorthand uh, Q for the transformed importance weights. Okay. Then I normalize the transformed important, importance weights, and I build my approximation. Okay. So it's, it's as simple as that. Now, what's this nonlinearity? What is this nonlinearity doing? Well, there are many possibilities to employ here, but essentially, what we want to do with that transformation, what we want to do when we apply this function phi to the standard weights, is to reduce the variability of the whole set of weights. Okay? So, in principle, any function uh, such that the variance of the transformed weights is lesser than the variance of the uh, standard weights, uh, should work here. We have tried essentially uh, two schemes, but especially this one. Okay? Now, so the, the, the two methods that you can find in the, in the papers are essentially either the tempering class or the clipping class. So with tempering, you it's very simple. You essentially take the weight and you rise it to some power less than one. Okay? So we have seen over the week different examples of tempering here. Uh, Clipping is a little, more, a little bit more elaborate, but this, it's, it's what I have, we have been using the examples I'm going to show you today. Um, what you do is that you sort the weights, for example, in descending order, and then you truncate them. So you take the first few, let's say, capital N sub C weights, the biggest ones, and you make them all equal. For example, equal to the last of them, or maybe equal to the average of them. It would work in the same way. Right. And all the other weights are left untouched. One could, one could, by the way, modify this scheme in, in, in several ways. So this, uh, sometimes we call this hard clipping. You could use some sort of, uh, of soft clipping uh, using some sigmoid function instead of truncation. You could do different things here. Uh, but essentially, as I said, what you want is to reduce the variability. And you do it by taking the biggest weights. Uh, and the biggest weights, bear in mind, 
there may be many orders of magnitude bigger than the rest of them, and you somehow bring them down. Okay? So graphically, this is what you do. Uh, if these are your weights, you sort them in descending order, then you take these big weights here, and you just equalize them. You make them constant. Okay? You flatten the representation in a way. Uh, by the way, when you flatten these big weights here, because you are going to normalize later, then you are bringing up the smaller weights as well. So in, uh, you can also think of this transformation as, some, or as um, spreading the probability mass uh, a bit more. Uh, and that's essentially it. Okay, so all you need is a sensible transformation for your weights and you plug it in your, into your important sampler. You could use this, uh, uh, this trick in, in different kinds of algorithms, but uh, we have been mostly interested in adaptive important samplers. So these are uh, iterative, iterative important sampling schemes where you keep computing a sequence of proposals, hopefully every proposal a bit better than the previous one, in order to improve your representation. Okay? So again, this would be a conventional, very general adaptive important sampler. We start uh, uh, an initialization phase choosing a proposal Q0, and then you apply a standard important sampling, sampling to obtain uh, samples and weights. And then at, at the iterative steps, what you do is that you take your approximation in the previous iteration, samples and weights, Somehow, according to some criterion, you compute a new proposal, and then you draw from the new proposal, compute weights, and so on. What's the trick when you introduce a nonlinear important sampler? Just the computation of transformed weights again. So the algorithm is nearly the same, but uh, you uh, introduce this uh, nonlinearity here. Okay. So again, it's, it's very simple, very easy to implement, very straightforward, uh, hardly any additional computational cost, and also hardly any additional intellectual cost. Okay. Um, so, before showing you some, some results and some examples, uh, let me talk a little bit again about why we did this. I mean, what's the intuition uh, uh, behind this? Again, everything that this, oops, sorry, that this clipping transformation has to do is to reduce the variability of the weights. So your problem is that you will have, if you do nothing, you will have one or two weights, which will be huge. They will be many orders of magnitude bigger than the others. And that's what you want to fix. So any transformation that addresses that issue, that numerical issue, should be fine here, in principle, okay? When you do that, you are also uh, preserving the diversity, because then your, uh, your weights will become more evenly balanced, and if you uh, apply some resampling procedure, or, or probably, or, or if you compute your new proposal, uh, your new proposal will be exploring a bigger region of the, st of the state space compared to the standard, uh, to standard scheme. Okay. Other way to see it is something that I also mentioned, you can think of uh, flattening a uh, little bit um, your uh, approximate representation, your Monte Carlo representation, in the sense that if you, if you okay, imagine your approximation as something like this without transformation, when you clip, you're basically, basically truncating here, so you are going to get some sort of mollified version with a plateau here, okay? So there are different ways of looking at the kind of transformation that you are introducing. Basically, you reduce the weight variability, you preserve the diversity of your samples. Problem, we're introducing additional error by doing this, okay? Because the weights are not proper anymore. So let me show you first some analytical results uh, and then some examples. So, uh, first, uh, convergence. Uh, this is not showing that the algorithm is any better than conventional important samplers. This is rather uh, some sort of sanity check to show you that you do not destroy your convergence properties by performing this operation. 
despite uh, the additional error you may be introducing. Okay? So let's take uh, a simple uh, important sampler. So the target PDF is P. This, what you can compute is this H here. So the weight function is this B of X, the ratio of H, of H over Q, Q being the proposal. Let's say the, uh, the transformation is a clipping function. As I said, uh, well, the proof would work the same for a family of, of functions which are similar to clipping, actually. And P sub R N is the Monte Carlo approximation. Well, what you have to do, since your transformation is introducing additional error, additional bias, what you really have to do is to control the amount of bias. And it turns out it's very simple. Essentially, as long as the number of samples that you clip is at most the square root of the number of the total number of samples, essentially the error that you introduce will be of the same order of the Monte Carlo error that you already have. Okay? So essentially you keep the same convergence rate. Okay. So again, this is, it's quite simple and this is not showing that the algorithm is any better than the standard important samplers. It's just a sanity check. So there is a very simple way you can make sure your algorithm is not uh, going to uh, be destroyed by, uh, by the additional error. It's not going to accumulate. Okay. Now, uh, over the week, we have been seeing different versions of algorithms, uh, particle MCMC and, and variations of it, also important samplers applied to the problem of, um, of estimating uh, parameters in state space models. So uh, we most, actually most of the examples where we have applied this technique are of that type. So we are approximating, we're estimating some parameter theta in a state space model. So where theta can be a parameter uh, in the uh, Markov kernel, in the Markov transition, or in the observation equation, or in both. And it turns out uh, that you can apply the method safely as well, and you, have, uh, um, you can have um, an exact approximation property with this method too. So uh, the aim here would be the target distribution would be the posterior distribution of the unknown parameters conditional on the parameters theta, uh, sorry, conditional on the uh, observations which are denoted by y here from one to time t. And the form of the posterior would be the likelihood for theta times the prior over the normalization constant. The likelihood can be written in terms of the elements of the state space model. These are the likelihoods and these are the transition densities. We have seen this expression before. And, and, and it has been said many times here that actually you can use a standard particle filtering methods to obtain an unbiased uh, est estimate <clears throat> of this likelihood. So you can use your favorite particle filter, even a basic bootstrap filter, to obtain an estimate, L sub D sub R N, and this estimate is going to be unbiased. Right. So under those, uh, within that setup, the way the nonlinear important sampler would look like would be this simple algorithm here. So you choose a proposal, generate samples, uh, for the parameters, you estimate the likelihood for each one of these samples using a standard particle filter. Then you compute the non-normalized weights. The, these weights are uh, random, even conditional on the, on the location of the sample, okay? Because they are estimates. You run a particle filter to obtain this estimate here. So if you run it twice with the same uh, parameter, you, may, you will get two different things, two different numbers there. Then you transform the weights using your clipping nonlinearity, and you construct your approximation. So if the likelihood G in the state space model is bounded, and the ratio between the prior for the parameter and the proposal is bounded, and you choose the number of particles of samples to be clipped uh, to be up to the square root of the total number of samples, so the same condition as before, then we again have convergence with the usual uh, Monte Carlo rate of the square root of the number of samples. Okay? 
So again, I'm not showing that this is any uh, better than a standard important sampler. I'm just showing that things keep working properly with uh, when you apply this this transformation. That in that uh, even if it introduces additional bias. So this is an exact approximation theorem. Even despite of the errors in the computations of the likelihood, you still converge to the to the uh, true interval you want to approximate. Okay. So let me show you some numerics now, some examples, and I, I, I hope I can make clear what, what you can expect to get uh, with this kind of uh, technique. Um, so this is exactly uh, a problem of estimating the parameters of a state space model. So uh, the, the an example of the setup I have just explained. And I'm going to consider a, a target tracking problem. So I have an object moving in a, a certain region. For the sake of the simulation, it's a, it's a two-dimensional region. Um, the state of the object is given by its position and its velocity. And, so, and this object is transmitting some radio signal. So uh, you place sensors on the region you want to monitor. And each sensor is able to uh, measure the um, power of the radio signal transmitted by the object. So the object is transmitting with some power P0, which we don't know. And depending on the physical environment, uh, the measurement will depend on the distance between the position of the target and the position of the sensor. And then we have this exponent, this, uh, this exponent here which depends on the physical features of, of, of the environment. So this is unknown as well. And then we have sensitivity parameter rho. This is basically the level of the background noise. So if your object is infinitely far away from your sensor, so these terms away, these terms here, this term here fades away, it vanishes. Uh, this rho determines essentially what your sensor is measuring when there is nothing to measure. Okay. So it's just the level of background noise, essentially. And then the, the measurement is contaminated with Gaussian noise. So given a sequence of observations from your collection of sensors, what you want to estimate is uh, the posterior distribution of your unknown parameters, which are the transmitted power, the path loss exponent, and the sensitivity parameter rho. And we are running the nonlinear importance sampler in an iterative form. So it's a nonlinear adaptive importance sampler with Gaussian proposals. So it's very simple, actually. This could be improved probably uh, in more efficient ways. What we do at each iteration is that we look at the samples and weights for, from the previous iteration. We compute the mean and the covariance. And we use a Gaussian for the new, to propose the new samples with that mean and that covariance. So extremely simple. Now, the trajectories uh, look like this. So this is the region where we are performing the tracking. The blue squares are the sensors. And typically, the object is going to move, bouncing off the borders of the region. So you get trajectories of this sort, right? We have applied several algorithms, well, several, three algorithms to, to solve the problem, OK? Uh, here, uh, well, PMC stands for Population Monte Carlo. That was terminology we were using in, in, in that paper. It's basically this adaptive important sampler with Gaussian proposals that I have just described. Okay? And this is the uh, performance is this blue curve. And this is, this is mean square error. And this is the number of samples that you use per iteration. Okay? We're iterating this thing, I think it was 15 times. Well, no, it must be 10 from this graph. Well, 10 times, and this is the performance that you get. Uh, okay? With 100, 200, and 500, well, sorry, 50, 100, 200, 500 samples per iteration. We also used uh, uh, AMIS. This is adaptive multiple importance sampling. Okay, this is an algorithm where the samples are recycled. So at each iteration, you update your proposal. The proposals are Gaussian as well. And then you take all your 
previous samples from all the iterations and you reweight them according to the new proposal. So at each iteration, you are obtaining a bigger grid for the representation. So this is obviously better than the standard uh, PMC and uh, this is the performance that you obtain. And then uh, we run a particle Metropolis Hastings where we, with Gaussian kernel, where we uh, try to optimize the, the, the parameters of the kernel by trial and error. Anyway, we weren't able to get anything better than this curve here. Now, uh, and this is for reference essentially. Okay? Now, if you just plug this uh, transformation of the weights into the standard adaptive important sampler or the uh, adaptive multiple important sampler, so we obtain nonlinear versions, it is NPMC and NMIS, you immediately have this gain. Okay? So these two curves here at the bottom are the performances with the nonlinear version of the PMC. So you go from this curve here to this red curve down here in terms of MSE. And for the multiple important sampler, you get from here to down here with a green curve. Okay. So it's very simple. Uh, you don't have much to think. You don't have much to code. And you can get uh, some, often a significant performance improvement almost for free. Okay. And this is the same. This is just showing the, the increase in the, in the effective sample size that you get together with the reduction in the error. Uh, in the experiments that we, we, that we have tried, this used to be better than, uh, than the particle Metropolis Hastings. Again, we didn't put a huge effort in optimizing the, the particle uh, MCMC. We didn't put a huge effort in optimizing the proposals for the adaptive important sampler anyway. Uh, but normally, uh, for, for this example, this is the performance that you get when you have five samples, uh, sorry, 500 samples per iteration, 10 iterations, and to get close to this performance, which is uh, obtained, well, with a total of 5,000 samples generated, you need uh, nearly uh, 50,000 samples in the chain for the same problem. So I'm not saying that this is going to be always the case, but in the few examples we have tried, normally you, you can get a bit, you can do a bit better. So, um, I guess I'm a bit late, so I'm going to skip the second example because it's a bit long. This is about stochastic kinetic models, so biochemical reactions. It's interesting, but it takes uh, time to explain it. So, and, and, and what you observe in the end is essentially the same thing. So, let me skip this part. Let me move to the second part of the talk. So, notch particle filters. It's again same kind of approach. We, uh, in this case, we are dealing with particle filters, not adaptive important samplers. But what we want to do is to come up with some simple additional step that can improve the performance. Right. So uh, it, it's filtering. So uh, we are dealing with the state space Markov models. Sorry that I'm changing the notation a little bit. But now, well, x is my. Uh, uh, sequence of states. I collect observations y, which are conditional independent. I'm still using g for the likelihood or the potential, as you want to call it. And I'm using kappa for the Markov kernels, so for the transitions of the states, the dynamics of the, of the state sequence. In a filtering problem, the goal is to approximate the sequence of posterior distributions. Actually, we normally have two sequences that we may want to approximate. One is the sequence of optimal filters. I'm using pi t for this one. It's the, this, the posterior distribution of the state given the observations up to time t. And we are often interested as well in the predictive measure. So the posterior distribution of the state x t conditional on the observations up to time t minus 1. Um, this can be computed recursively using these uh, well-known equations. And the very basic uh, bootstrap filter constructs approximations of, of both sequences of measures using this very simple algorithm. Okay. 
So we start drawing IOD samples from the prior, and then at each time step, we take the, uh, the samples that we already have from the previous time step, we propagate them one step forward in time using the Markov kernel, and then we compute weights which are proportional to the likelihoods. So we, we have seen this algorithm many times over the week, uh, so it's very simple and often it even works. Uh, well, then we resample. I'm assuming that we resample at every time step. Okay. The particle approximations have this form. This is for the filter, this is for the predictive measure. So here we use the samples uh, right after sampling. Here we use the samples right after resampling. And this is how you approximate your intervals with respect to the predictive measure, with respect to the uh, optimal filter. Okay, so is, this is everything very standard. Now, the same as before, let me explain you the algorithm by, by just looking at what you do with the standard one. So this is the bootstrap filter. What would be uh, the, our notched bootstrap filter? It would be this algorithm where we essentially add these two steps here. So uh, as before, we draw from the Markov kernel if you have a different particle filter, you just draw from your favorite proposal. Okay. Here we, st we stick with the bootstrap filter for simplicity. So we draw from the Markov kernel. Then we select a subset of particles that we are going to notch. So select the number of particles for to which we are going to apply a transformation. We are going to shift their location somehow. And then for every uh, index in this set of uh, selected ones, I take the position of the particle and I change it using some map alpha. So I take a, a subset of my particles, I just move them, I just push them. Then I compute normalized weights and I resample. The weights here do not take into account the transformation. Okay? So again, the weights are not proper. And again, I'm introducing additional error in my Monte Carlo representation, same as before. What's this map, this uh, alpha here? Well, I'm going to call it an edging operator. It's just a map. It takes a point in the state space and it returns another point in the state space. So very easy, very simple. Uh, but it has to return a point for which the likelihood at time t is uh, greater than or equal to the original one. So these few selected particles that you are uh, shifting, they should be shifted in a direction that increases their likelihood. Okay, so that, that's the notching function. That's my alpha. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. There are two things I need to do. First, I, I, I need to select my, my samples, and I have to, uh, to push them. I have to notch them. I have to transform them. There are possibly plenty of ways you could do this. Uh, essentially, in the experiments, we have tried two kinds of, of, um, of methods to, for selection. Uh, both of them are essentially random. The difference is how many particles you choose to notch for each one of them. With batch, batch nudging here, we mean that we randomly select a subset of particles of fixed size. So we decide to nudge M particles, uh, capital M, and we exactly randomly, uh, I think it was even uniformly in experiments, we uniformly select M indices, and those ones are the particles we're going to nudge. With independent nudging, uh, you take each uh, particle and uh, you nudge it with probability m over n, or you leave it as it is with probability 1 minus m over n. The advantage of this procedure is that you can uh, process in parallel, so you can uh, process each uh, particle independently of the others. You decide whether it is going to be natural or not, and then you transform it or not. Uh, one, missed one missed advantage, not for the simulations, but may maybe if you need a more serious implementation, is that the number of uh, particles that you notch is going to be random. Okay. The expected number is m, but it will be a random variable. 
I think it's uh, probably suitable for, uh, for parallel implementations if you need something that runs really fast. How do you choose your alpha? Uh, again, we have done very simple things here. We have essentially tried these two methods here. So if I tell you, look, you have to move from this point X to some other point where the likelihood is a bit bigger, probably the first thing that you will think about is exactly using the gradient of G. So you just take one or a few steps up the derivatives, uh, up the partial derivatives of, of function G. And that's what we have tried as well. Here, you, have to, you, you will have to tune the size of these steps. So you have a parameter to be tuned, which is this gamma. And, and, and performance may be sensitive to the value of this gamma. Uh, something else you can do if you don't want to, if you want to make it uh, uh, more automatic is some random nudging. So uh, for each particle you want to nudge, you just add some noise and check whether the point where you are moved to is uh, a bit better than the old one. If it is, you can keep it, otherwise you try again. The problem here, of course, is that the running time becomes random. So you, uh, you don't know a priori how many, well, depending on the, on the, on the uh, type of uh, perturbation you introduce here, it may take longer or shorter time to, yes? Uh, you, yes, you could. I mean, uh, essentially here what you want is something uh, simple, so computational to costly, but efficient in taking you to a region of higher likelihood. So any kind of scheme that you can think of, you, you could plug it in there. And, and then f you may have more specific methods, of course. For example, if you think of the example of this target tracking thing I showed you 10 minutes ago, there the observations depended, on, depended only on part of the state, depending on the position of the object. Uh, depended directly on the position of the object of, of the object they did not depend directly on the velocity of the object so you could think of methods to uh, nudge the position of the target so the part of the state on which the observation depends directly and then the part of the state uh, which remains unobserved could could be moved uh, to keep it coherent with with the, with the, the observed part but essentially, we have tried these two. Now, so a few words. Uh, AJ, how much time do I have? I have seven minutes. Okay. So, uh, a few words about this. Uh, if you look into a literature, there are plenty of algorithms uh, of nudging filters. But in most cases, uh, okay, these are techniques which are applied in geophysics, and normally they are dealing with problems where you have where the, the observations and the states are living in the same space. So you have linear observations, and in that case, nudging is thought of as using essentially something very similar to a Kalman update to push the particles in the, in the, in the, to, towards the observations, okay. which is not exactly what we're doing here. And most importantly, the weights are proper. So uh, uh, in all these algorithms can be seen as designing sophisticated proposals. And then you compute your weights according to those proposals. And the weight computation in those cases can be quite costly compared to a basic algorithm. There are also something called implicit particle filtering. Uh, a number of methods are also quite, uh, can, can be qu quite efficient. However, they are also computationally uh, heavy sometimes. Here, the, the idea is similar. What you want is to shift your particles or to generate your particles in regions with high posterior probability. But to do that, you often have to solve model-dependent equations, uh, mu sets of uh, I mean, multidimensional model-dependent equations, which can be quite complicated. It's, it, it, takes, uh, it can take considerable effort. So I, we actually avoid all this. I mean, we just... Uh, move, nudge the particles in a very simple way. We just want to increase the likelihood a bit. Uh, we don't do anything to the weight, so they are not proper. Well, let them be not proper. And so the result is something computationally very simple. Uh, same kind of sanity check as before. I'm not going into details here. I'm just saying if you do this nudging, 
and you control the number of particles that you uh, shift basically in the same way as before, so they, you keep them of the order of the square root of the total number of particles, then you are safe. Okay, you will be uh, uh, changing your distribution a bit, but asymptotically, you get the same error rates. Okay. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Okay, let me tell, yeah, let me try to explain this. Um, what is more, more interesting is the following. We observed in simulations that the Natch particle filter had a very nice feature that was that it was usually uh, more robust than the standard filter when you had errors in the, in the model. So uh, you change, for example, you change, for example, some parameter in the model and, and you design your algorithm uh, blind to this error and then the bootstrap filter would easily get uh, lost, lose track of the state and, and, the, and the notched version seemed to work much better. Okay. So we uh, tried to, to, to provide an explanation for this and we came to this, uh, to this interpretation. So let M0 be this model, so a state space model, and given a fixed set of observations, you construct a modified model of this form, depending on the alpha, which depends on the observations as well. Okay. So if you do this, it turns out that the, this notch version of the bootstrap filter, it's just like another bootstrap filter, but running on the modified model rather than the original one. Okay? And it turns out that for the sequence of observations for which the modified model has been constructed, the evidence for that model, so the, the likelihood of the model, is always bigger than for the original one. Okay. So you can think of the method as an algorithm uh, that runs a standard filter, but on a modified model, model which is tailored to the, uh, to, the, to the fixed observations that you have. And in that way, you, say you, you adapt your dynamics to the observations. And that's why it seems to be a bit better. So since uh, I have no time, apparently I'm going to show you directly uh, uh, just one example and a video. So this is for the Lorentz 63 model. Uh, it has appeared this thing a couple of times before in, the, in, in other talks. This is the uh, discrete time version with Gaussian noise. I have observations which are a single variable, and I'm going to apply here both the bootstrap filter and the notch version of the bootstrap filter. Okay. So uh, there is a mismatch. So um, I run the algorithms with an error in one of the parameters, and because of this error, the notch version of the algorithm is consistently better, this is normalized mean square error, than the standard version. And what happens when you look at the trajectories of the estimates is that the standard bootstrap filter gets lost often, this is the black curve, while the notch version keeps tracking uh, correctly most of the time. And now the video is not going to work here, so um, let me show you what, ha what happens. Uh, it's here. How do I? This is what happens. Okay, I will finish here. The so the black dot is the state, the current state, how it evolves. This is a projection or playing of two of the coordinates of the Lorentz system. The red cloud is the uh, cloud, the particles of the bootstrap filter. You see it's struggling to track, and often it gets lost, especially when there is transition from one lobe to the other. Uh, the, the, the filter struggles to, to follow. You see the difference, there is a uh, rather coarse difference as well. Here it <coughs> switches and the particles stay here. And this is what happens with the notched particle filter. So what we see is the same as before, but now we have blue particles and red particles. The blue particles are the ones that we notch. So, and we use them somehow to probe, the, the, to, probe to explore the state of space so that they move uh, to regions of a slightly higher likelihood. And by doing that, what you expect is that they uh, will uh, get locked to the observations and they will drag the rest of the cloud to keep the, uh, the filter tracking. Okay, and this is what we observe here. From time to time, especially when we switch from one lobe to the other, we, you can see how the 
cloud stretches and eventually the blue notch particles manage to drag the whole thing in the, in the right direction. Okay? And, well, this is essentially how it works. I guess I have run out of time, so I will leave it here. Thank you.